Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to July's Business of Alt Protein Seminar. You can see quite a few of you uh, trickling in right now, so I'll give everyone a minute or two to join. Uh, in the meantime, I'd love to hear where everyone is calling in from today. Uh, I'm actually out in Wyoming, um, but would love to know where everyone else is. Our, our speaker is dialing in from, so we're represented here in the West. If you wanted to pop where you're calling in from in the chat, would love to say hello. We'll give everyone a minute or so to, to join. Hello, welcome. There's some folks from Chicago, Boston, San Diego, neighbor in Montana. Love to see that. All the way from Israel, Taiwan. I'm impressed with that time difference. Hello from Poland, Vancouver. Love to see everyone on the seminar today. Oh. Very amazing. I think we can go ahead and get started uh, with some of our introductions. Uh, so my name is Audrey and I am GFI's Startup Innovation Lead. Um, really excited to welcome you to July's seminar. And today we are covering all things labeling. So we'll be talking about standards of identity, nomenclature, claims, and more. Uh, this talk is designed to be applicable for companies across the plant-based cultivated and fermentation sectors uh, as you bring your products to market, uh, particularly in the United States. We do have an hour and a half set aside for the seminar today, so we'll have lots of time for Q&A towards the end. Um, before we do get started, I just want to lay out a few housekeeping items. First, for anyone who's new to the work of the Good Food Institute, we are an international nonprofit organization and we're focused on developing the roadmap for a sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. So to do that, we identify the most effective solutions, we mobilize resources and talent, and we empower partners across the food system to make all proteins accessible, affordable, and perhaps most importantly, delicious. Second, we will be recording this. So don't worry if you miss something, uh, you can always watch a recording afterwards. We'll be posting the recording to our YouTube channel and we will be emailing all of you a copy of the recording today. And third, uh, for anyone who might've missed the announcement, we are bringing back the Good Food Conference, which will be held in San Francisco this September. Uh, this conference brings together over 1,000 innovators, scientists, policymakers, industry leaders and global champions for all proteins. Uh, you really don't wanna miss it. And we will pop in a registration link into the chat so you can register and join us there in September. And last, but certainly not least, please ask your questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat. Uh, this just helps us keep track of it. You are more welcome to ask questions throughout the seminar. Uh, however, we will answer them towards the end, about 30 minutes allocated just towards Q&A, so we will get as many questions as possible. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Justin Procknow. Justin works in the Denver office of the international law firm Greenberg Traring. They currently have over 2,000 lawyers in 42 offices around the U.S. and internationally. They practice law in almost every single area, and Justin is the co-chair of their National Food, Beverage, and Agribusiness Group, which has attorneys in a wide range of practice areas assisting companies in the food and beverage, dietary supplement, and cosmetic personal care products industries. So Justin represents a huge range of regulatory issues from labeling and advertising review, uh, including websites, infomercials, labels, and brochures. Uh, he assists with FDA inspections and warning letters, and he also works with companies to respond to FDA inquiries. Uh, Justin, welcome to our have with us today, and I will now hand it over to you to talk about all things about what's in the label. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to the Good Food Institute for having me today. 
Uh, I look forward to talking with everyone. It's great to see the wide range of people coming from not only across the US, but countries. I saw Korea, Israel, France in there, Canada. Um, so great to see the interest in this topic from such a wide uh, group of people. Um, this is an area that I've uh, been working with companies on for a while. As um, Audrey said, uh, you know, I'm the chair of our food, beverage, and supplement practice uh, here at Greenberg Traurig. Um, you can see a variety of the companies that I work with uh, behind me, as well as the big Manchester United banner uh, there. Um, you know, it, it's a very interesting um, area. We were going to do a presentation at the big natural product show, Expo West, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, set for March of 2020, which all of you might remember uh, a little something called COVID happened and canceled Expo West and a variety of other things. We had a great panel lined up. Uh, on plant-based food alternatives with, um, you know, the leader of the Plant-Based Food Association and uh, Madeline Hayden from Nut Pods, which is an almond milk-based creamer, and um, Jamie from Tofurky, who'd been involved in a lot of things and, and uh, of course, didn't get to do it. And then they didn't have the show the next year. And um, I'm, I'll actually be speaking on plant-based foods at Supply Side West out in Las Vegas. It continues to be, you know, a huge topic. So I'm, I'm glad we could talk about it here today. I'm going to uh, see if we get the right screen on here. I think we did. Um, and talk a little bit about what um, what we're we're doing here. So again, Today, we're going to talk a lot about regulatory um, issues and concerns with respect to companies in the plant-based uh, food situation. And, and, you know, to my understanding, GFI really works with three different types of alternative protein uh, companies, you know, the kind of probably the most well-known, the plant-based food alternatives. Um, and then we have the cultivated meat and the uh, fermented uh, meat. So we'll try to, um, a lot of my discussion uh, applies the same to all three of those types of things, but uh, to the extent it doesn't, um, you know, we'll, we'll try to be specific on some things. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about the labeling regulations for those types of products. Uh, some of the claims that you can make and the, and the requirement for substantiation of claims. Um, and, and then maybe, you know, just some of the other manufacturing and other considerations uh, for products in this area. And um, as Audrey said, you know, please feel free to put your questions and answers in the, uh, in the uh, Q&A section. And uh, we will try to get to many as we can uh, at the end of uh, my presentation. So, we're gonna start with labeling. When we talk about labeling, it's important to know what the FDA um, means by labeling. And for most of this, I'm gonna be talking about it from a labeling perspective. We'll talk a little bit about the, the differences. Uh, you know, the two main federal regulatory agencies that are going to be governing uh, alternative protein sources are the US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and the um, United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA. And the USDA regulates meat, poultry, and egg products. Uh, and the FDA essentially regulates all other types of food products. And, and there's a little bit of overlap, especially when we get into the cultured uh, meat uh, products. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. But for the most part, we're talking about FDA rate, uh, labeling. And the FDA regulates labeling as defined in the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And, and really labeling, the definition of labeling is the immediate label of the product and any written, printed, or graphic material accompanying the product. Um, and one of the things we'll talk about is that the regulations really haven't been uh, revised 
um, in detail. There was a little bit of revision in some of the nutrition facts panel, but the main regulations were created a number of years ago before this fancy new thing called the internet happened. Um, and the regulations still don't really address the internet. Um, much. So most of the regulations really contemplate more of sales at brick and mortar retail locations instead of online. So a lot of the interpretation of some of these regulations has been um, made by the FDA, but it's not really set out in the regulation. So the FDA would say, you know, accompanying the product means brochures, booklets, films, sound recordings, and it also includes the website. So the FDA takes the position that if you have your website address on the label of your product, or you sell products on your website, then all of the content on your website will be viewed in the same light as if it was directly on the label of your product. Essentially, the FDA views that if you include your website address on your label, you are essentially incorporating everything on your website as part of the label. And they've now even expanded that to social media so that if you have social media icons or links on your label or on your website, that most of the content on your social media sites will also be viewed in the same context if it's on the label of your product. So this is really important for companies to realize because I, I get a lot of clients um, who say like, oh, well, we don't really make any claims um, you know, on the label. Uh, you know, we just provide all that information on the website. Well, guess what? You're now, the FDA would view that as really being no different than making those claims right on the label of the product. So your content still has to be compliant in the same way as if it was directly on the label. Um, and that really is the, uh, the majority of what I do, whether it's a sad statement of my life or not, is on a daily basis, you know, I probably have 20 different clients that I work with where I'm either reviewing labels, websites, uh, marketing and advertising materials, um, and, and providing advice on what is compliant or not. You know, I probably lead the firm in clients saying, uh, you know, do you have 15 minutes? Can we jump on the phone and talk through these three claims we want to make? Or we take a quick look at this video that we want to post on the website and make sure there's there's nothing wrong with it. So, you know, you really want to make sure that you understand what can and can't be said about products. So when we look at labeling and when I review a label for clients, I'm really looking at it from two different points of view. The first is kind of the, the technical uh, compliance with the labeling regulations set out by the FDA. And those regulations are in the Code of Federal Regulations at 21 CFR Part 101. And really the standard elements of a label include a statement of identity and the net quantity of contents on the front panel of the product, a nutrition facts panel, or if you're selling a dietary supplement, a supplement facts panel, um, the ingredients list and the identification of any food allergens, and then the name and address of the uh, manufacturer, the packer, or the distributor. And then depending on the type of product, you might also need to include some warnings. Uh, if it's being imported from another country, the country of origin, you know, like product of Italy or, you know, made in Korea, something along those lines so that uh, people know where it's coming from. Those are kind of the main elements. I'm going to go into detail on each one. Um, and we're going to start with statement of identity. And this is probably the topic that's going to... Um, my guess engender more questions um, and discussion than anything else that we talk about today, because the statement of identity for plant-based uh, food alternatives, including uh, alternative proteins, um, has been a source of much discussion in the industry, um, you know, over the last 20 years, but certainly a increased focus over the last five years. So the statement of identity is basically what the product is. And you're required to put a statement of identity on the front panel of the product. Um, and there's kind of a hierarchy of how you determine what the statement of identity is. So if there's a name specified in a particular law or regulation, um, 
called a standard of identity, then you have to use that name set out in the standard of identity. And there's there's not a standard of identity for every type of product, um, but there are for certain products. You know, there's a standard of identity for juice, and there's a standard of identity for chocolate, and you have to meet the criteria that's in that standard of identity to call a product that you know that butter is one um, mayonnaise is one and some of these standards of identity and when we have plant-based food alternatives um, this has become the question as to whether you can still use that standard of identity even if your um, pro your product doesn't meet all of the criteria uh, for that particular standard of identity. So if there's a standard of identity, you're supposed to use that. If there isn't one, then you have to use the common or usual name of the food, peanut butter. There's actually not a regulation that establishes what, what constitutes peanut butter, but certainly a common or usual name for the food. So if there's no set regulation, then you use the common or usual name of the food. If there's no common or usual name of the food, then you have to use an appropriately descriptive term or when the nature of the food is obvious, a fanciful name commonly used by the public. So um, that statement of identity has to be in bold type and the way the regulation reads in a size reasonably related to the most prominent printed material on the front panel. The FDA has interpreted that to mean 50% of the largest type, although, the regulation doesn't specifically say that, um, but it, you know it has. To, it can't be the smallest type on the label. It should stand out so that someone can read that and immediately know what is this product. <laughs> so, as we talked about, there's been much discussion over appropriate standards of identity for plant-based alternatives and alternative proteins, and this really goes back to starting with. Um, the milk category and having things like soy milk or almond milk. Uh, and, you know, is it really milk if it doesn't come from a, a you know, from a cow um, or an animal? Um, does it meet the definition of milk? And the, the answer is it doesn't meet the standard of identity set forth in the uh, regulations. And you know, we've seen varying levels of action, truthfully, most often not as much with regulators, but with competitors in the uh, space, um, competitors to the plant-based uh, alternatives. You know, we would say the companies making the, the standard food and then taking issue with plant-based food companies coming along and using that same name. Um, we saw this kind of come to a head a couple of years ago with Miyoko's Kitchen um, and the state of California, because they, uh, in California, you have to submit uh, dairy products or plant-based alternatives to the state of California for approval. And California basically said, you can't call it butter uh, because it doesn't meet the standard of identity for butter. And Miyoko's Kitchen actually sued the state of California. And it went up to uh, several of the courts. And essentially, the court determined that um, if a company makes a, uh, basically what they said was the state of California didn't prove that the name used by Miyoko's Kitchen was misleading um, because they qualified it as cultured vegan butter. And essentially what the court said there is, if you make an appropriate qualification of a standard of identity, there, you know, there's a case that it is not misleading. And California didn't argue that at all. So um, the court found in favor of Miyoko's Kitchen. Um, this was really an important kind of decision laying the groundwork for a lot of plant-based food companies and the statement of identity um, and, and is really kind of how the FDA has now um, followed this, they issued a guidance in um, earlier this year um, entitled Labeling of Plant-Based Milk Alternatives and Voluntary Nutrient Statements. And essentially what the FDA said after 20, 30 years of the dairy industry 
going back and forth with almond milk and soy milk and um, all the different plant-based milk alternatives. And essentially the FDA said, if you make an appropriate qualifier of that uh, standard of identity, um, that that's permissible. So whether it's you know dairy-free milk or if it's almond milk or soy milk or something where it's clear that you're not making the case that um, that this is actually there's not going to be confusion that this is actually a dairy-based milk um, that that is permissible. Um, and so I run into this with clients all the time, whether it's uh, uh, you know uh, garbanzo bean pasta or uh, you know plant-based cheese. And you know the key to all of this is making clear um, that your product is a modified version of it. And you know whether it's by calling it vegan butter or plant-based or dairy-free, you know, whatever qualifiers you can put on there to make it clear that this is different than the normal standard of identity gives you the argument that it's a permissible statement. And, and really, this is probably, again, less likely to be an FDA-driven um, issue. If someone takes issue with it, it's either going to be competitors or it's going to be our friends, the class action plaintiff lawyers trying to uh, drum up some business. So it's really important that you're clear. I, I get a lot of clients who say like, well, we want to call it mac and cheese, but it's not, it doesn't have actual dairy in it. So we're going to spell cheese with a Z. Um, and, and misspelling the word doesn't really do it. You, you still need to have some sort of um, plant-based or non-dairy or some sort of additional modifier, in my opinion, to really make the case that this is, you know, a plant-based um, alternative. So um, it gets a little more interesting when we get into some of the cultured meat and cultured chicken um, uh, issues. Uh, there have been several companies that have, and I guess let me step back a little bit because it's a, it can be a little bit confusing as to how cultured animal cells are regulated in the US. So the very quick Reader's Digest 30 second uh, version of it is both the FDA and the USDA regulate cultured meat products here in the United States. And I know there's, I saw someone from Israel, there's a lot of, um, exploration of cultivated meat in Israel. We have a Tel Aviv office, so we've been working on a lot of those um, types of, of products. Here in the U.S., it's, it's kind of a joint USDA-FDA uh, regulation. And really, they, they came to an agreement a couple of years ago and decided that uh, really the FDA oversees kind of the initial part of cultivated meat. They oversee the cell collection, the cell banks, cell growth. Um, and then once you get to that point, um, then there's kind of a transition to USDA uh, regulation. And they kind of, uh, USDA takes over kind of from the harvest through the processing and the labeling. Um, so we've had a couple companies that have um, basically had pre-market consultations with the FDA so that they could kind of submit their um, kind of their process and mode for going about this and see if the FDA had any issues. The first one was submitted back in November of 2022, um, and the FDA reviewed all of the uh, information submitted and basically uh, provided a no questions response. And uh, this is kind of something uh, unique for the FDA. The FDA rarely, if ever, approves things. Um, they basically just say we have no questions, which is essentially the best you're going to get. Uh, they won't come right out and say we approve it, but they'll say we have no questions. So most people treat that as somewhat akin to approval of it. So the FDA did, looked at the first one in November. They looked at the second one here in March and again, had no issues with the um, with the 
the overall safety of those products. Um, one thing important to be clear, the FDA did not approve the statement of identity, which for that one had referred to it as cultured chicken cell material, um, because really they viewed that as the USDA's uh, jurisdiction. Um, <coughs> The USDA has issued a proposed rule and requested comments on labeling of meat or poultry products comprised of or containing cultured animal cells um, and still hasn't finalized that guidance. But a, a particular note in this situation is that um, the, the USDA did approve uh, the first cell cultivated meat um, in June of this year. Uh, so, so just about a month ago, um, and indicated uh, that uh, upside foods um, would be allowed to um, put uh, a cultivated meat product uh, out on the market. Um, and it's gonna be out on the market and also launched uh, with a, a restaurateur. Um, so good news, for, certainly for the cultivated meat, um, uh, industry here in the US that um, things are moving forward. And um, again, uh, the important thing with that is going to be, again, making it clear that um, this is a different form of food. So whether it's called cultivated chicken, cultured chicken, um, but it's going to come down to making sure that the statement is not misleading. Um, in talking with uh, Audrey and others at GFI, you know, GFI has been very active on these, and and perhaps there'll be some discussion on that in the Q and A. Um, but GFI has certainly provided um, language in a citizens' petition um, on uh, the ability to qualify current standards of identity. Um, so that uh, plant-based alternatives and, and other forms of alternative protein can use that standard of identity with a qualifier again, in, in line with what we were talking about, the truthfully the FDA has said, um, GFI has also weighed in on the allowing of ingredients that are essentially the same as the standard ingredients identified in a standard of identity um, to meet that uh, standard of identity um, as well. And again, um, probably have some discussion on that if we have time in the Q&A. But um, really, ultimately, it comes down to you have to provide clear qualifying information, whether it's plant-based protein, vegan milk, milk, or cultivated meat. The qualifiers are going to be the key here to ensure that you're going to stay uh, above uh, any potential issues from uh, a competitor or from a class action plaintiff lawyer. Um, next, uh, that's the hard part <laughs> of all the labeling uh, until we get to the claims. The rest I'll go through fairly quickly so we can spend some time on other things, but fairly straightforward net quantity of contents. You have to have it in the bottom 30% of the front panel. Um, uh, you have to, uh, it has to be in terms of weight, volume, or numerical content. Um, so either, uh, you know, 12, 12 ounces, 354 grams, um, you know, uh, 16 fluid ounces, 473 milliliters, or 60 vegetarian capsules uh, if you're doing a, a dietary supplement. Uh, and then, you know, there's specific size parameters. Again, if it's a small panel, then the statement has to be at least 1 16th of an inch in size, uh, more than five square inches to 25 square inches, at least 1 8th of an inch in size, more than 25 square inches, at least 3 16ths of an inch in size, and then um, over 100 square inches, at least a quarter of an inch in size. Uh, so you just need to follow those parameters. Um, have to have a nutrition facts panel on any product regulated by the FDA as well as the USDA. Um, there were pretty big changes that uh, 
were announced in 2016 and became mandatory for everyone as of 2021. Um, you'll note a, a, you know, a huge increase in the size of calories. Um, added sugars were added uh, to the label. Vitamin D and potassium are now required nutrients to be declared and vitamin A and vitamin C were, I put demoted. You don't have to include those anymore. Um, some other general changes, very good. Uh, website uh, page on the FDA's website um, relating to all the changes in the nutrition facts label um, that you can use as a good resource, um, examples of panels and a bunch of other things. You can see the differences here again. The old panel had calories and you know the same type as everything else. The new one has calories that are, you know, the, the number of calories are three times the size of other things. We've got added sugars included down below here, some other kind of cosmetic changes uh, to the label. Um, for the purposes of our discussion here today and the, the types of products we're talking about, um, protein has become a big source of uh, class action lawsuits uh, and, and several main kind of triggers to a letter from a class action plaintiff lawyer. So the way the regulation basically reads is you must declare the amount of protein in any product, um, but you're not required to declare the daily value percentage um, for protein unless a claim is made about protein. Um, this is what has triggered a lot of letters from class action lawyers. Typically what you'll get is a letter saying, hey, We've uh, reviewed your label. You make a claim about protein, but you have failed to uh, declare the daily value percentage of protein. Um, we believe this is intentional because you don't want people to know what the percentage actually is. And my client would not have bought it if they had known what the actual daily value percentage of protein is. And then um, these are essentially, <laughs> for lack of a better term, legalized extortion. Um, they're trying to extract some amount of money from you. Um, and they basically try to characterize the settlement as, you know, some amount between the cost it will take you to defend and zero and try to put that number at the most that they can get and extract from you uh, without having to go to trial. Um, so we want to make sure that we get these right and that you're not just leaving yourself out there for easy shots from class action lawyers. So it is important to, to recognize that any claim about protein, if it says plant-based protein on the front, if it says 10 grams of protein on the front, any mention of protein triggers the requirement to include a daily value percentage. So it doesn't even have to be like copy in terms of like, hey, we have great plant-based protein. It can just be 10 grams protein, that is a claim that triggers the requirement to include the, the daily value percentage. So for, for normal meat protein or, whey, or protein from whey, um, the, the daily recommended value for protein is 50 grams. And so you take the number of grams of protein divided by 50, that's your daily value percentage. So you, you have 10 grams of protein from meat or whey, uh, your daily value percentage is going to be 20%. The nuance is that for many plant-based proteins, they are not complete proteins. They're missing one or more amino acids. And the ratio of uh, protein is not one-to-one -one like it would be with a regular meat or a uh, like a whey protein. And so They've come up with what's called the protein digestibility converted amino acids score, uh, PDCAS. Uh, it's not PDCAS score because it would be like saying uh, score score at the end. So the PDCAS, and you really need to adjust your daily value percentage based on the appropriate PDCAS. So, you know, very like, let's go with a very easy example just to explain. P protein generally has somewhere between 0.85 and 0.9. Let's use 0.9 for the purposes of our discussion. So you would take, let's say you had 10 grams of P protein, 
under normal circumstances, um, you know, you would divide that by 50 and you would get uh, 20%. When we have 10 grams of pea protein, we have to adjust it based on the PDCAS. So while we still declare 10 grams of pea protein, for the purposes of figuring out the daily value percentage, we multiply it by the 0.9. And so that would really be nine grams of pea protein divided by 50, we get 18%. So if you have 10 grams of pea protein, the proper declaration would be 10 grams, 18% instead of that 20%. And, you know, it can go down to things like almonds might only have a 0.45 PD cast. So you have 10 grams of almond protein, you multiply it by that 0.45, it's really equivalent to like 4.5 grams of protein, your daily value percentage is going to be 9% instead of 20%. Um, this is important for two things. One is this is what plaintiff lawyers are looking for. It also can adjust some of the claims you make. Whereas if under normal circumstances, 10 grams of, of protein would be 20%, that would allow you to make a excellent source of um, or um, rich in or high in protein claim. But if your 10 grams of protein are from almonds and it's really only 9%, now you're not eligible for that high in, rich in, excellent source of protein claim. So it's important to make those calculations so that you can also know what type of nutrient content claim you'd be allowed to be made. I, I realize this is kind of a confusing area so happy to discuss that more if there's questions and answers or to follow up with people, you know, after this. But it is a, a hot button area of um, scrutiny and action from class action plaintiff lawyers. Um, ingredients, you have to declare the ingredients in descending order of predominance by weight. The name for the ingredient should be the common or usual name. This is you know, kind of gets us back to the statement of identity. If one of your ingredients is a, um, you know, a plant-based protein, um, you know, then you should be declaring it by, you know, what that is, uh, whether it's pea protein or almond protein or, or something of that nature. If it's the cultivated meat, let's say you have the cultivated chicken from good meat that's an ingredient in the product, then it should be declared as cultivated chicken um, and not just as chicken. Um, and then, of course, if you have any of the nine major food allergens, it's been eight for many years. Um, just a reminder, sesame was added as the ninth major food allergen as of January 1st, 2023. And so you have to declare any of those nine major food allergens if they're in the product. And then the name and address. You have to declare the name and address of the manufacturer, packer, or distributor. Um, has to be the official company name, not a DBA. Um, the assumption is that the name and address listed is out of the manufacturer. If it's not, then you have to qualify it as manufactured for or distributed by, and then the name of the company. And you are really supposed to include the physical street address not a P.O. box, because it's really there designed for the FDA to be able to come and find you if necessary. I would say there's maybe less of a concern about this. If you have the information on your website, I get a lot of smaller clients who, you know, they're working out of their house. They don't want to put their home address on the labels of products and have people come looking them up all the time. Um, so I would say this is a little bit of a form over substance um, uh, you know, the regulation's been there for 40 years. And as long as it really was designed for companies not, you know, for customers to have an issue with the product and then not be able to find a company because they, you know, used a DBA on there and you can't find out anything about the product. And so um, it's really, uh, as long as they can track you down, it's not going to be a, a major concern. Um, we talked about country of origin. Just to be clear, I, I think I saw a brief uh, note from one of the Q&As. Um, there's really no difference between product of, let's say, Italy or made in Italy. They both indicate the same thing, which is that um, the, the way that the country of origin is determined is it's the last country for which a substantial 
transformation of the product took place. So typically if it's a processed food, it's where the processing or manufacturing took place. Um, and, uh, and that will be your country of origin. If, if you are selling the product in the US and the country of origin is the US, you're not required to include product of US on there. It's just if, it, if the country of origin is another country and you're selling in the US, you need to include that. There may be some products where certain warnings are necessary. There's a few warnings in the regulations um, and you know, for products that have higher levels of caffeine or other ingredients that might cause issues, uh, you may need to include some warnings on there. That's really the technical parts of a label. Again, you know, probably statement of identity being being the big one. Um, the rest of it, you know, fairly straightforward, can knock those out pretty quickly. You know, from an FDA perspective, there's really three different types of claims you can make for products: structure function claims, nutrient content claims, and health claims. And I'm going to go through those real quickly because uh, I do want to leave some time for Q&A at the end. Um, structure function claims are essentially claims that relate an ingredient or nutrient to an effect on the structure or function of the body. They're specifically authorized for dietary supplements in the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. Um, and the, the number one mantra to keep in mind when making claims about food products is you cannot sell a food beverage or dietary supplement product um, with the intention of diagnosing, treating, curing, or preventing a disease. That's one of the central things to keep in mind when you're making claims about a product is you cannot sell a non-drug product to diagnose, treat, cure, prevent a disease. If it's determined that that's what your product is saying, it's it will be considered a drug by the FDA. It doesn't matter if you can prove it. The Congress has simply decided that you cannot sell a non-drug product for that purpose. Albert Einstein could have done the clinical trial himself and determined that your cultivated chicken will help uh, cure cancer. Um, it doesn't matter because you can't sell a food product you know, to cure cancer. You're gonna to have to go through the drug approval process uh, to do that. You simply can't do it. It's not a, an issue of proof or substantiation. It's just, you can't sell non-drug products for that purpose. So, you know, you, you have to avoid the, certainly naming any sort of disease by name, but includes a lot of other types of things as well. Um, uh, symptoms of diseases, so lowering, uh, blood sugar, uh, reducing high cholesterol or high, high blood pressure, you know, would also be considered to be disease claims. Um, uh, names of products, uh, just because you got a great uh, trademark for it, doesn't mean you can use it. If you somehow were able to trademark the name Cancer Be Gone, um, you still can't use it for a non-drug product because clearly there's a claim being made that your product will help uh, treat cancer. And so um, you, you have to uh, consider the names of products as well um, when you're uh, deciding what claims you can make for a product. But brief thing, there's no non-drug product approved to treat COVID. You should not be making any claims that your product will help certainly treat COVID, but anything related to antiviral, antibacterial, um, is going to be viewed as a COVID claim. You know, both the FDA and the USDA get accused a lot of times of not exactly operating on a very quick basis. But I will tell you the, the quickest way to get uh, action from the FDA or the USDA is to say that your product will help uh, treat COVID or other viruses. Um, so just steer clear of COVID claims. Um, the second type of uh, claim being made, and probably the one that's going to come up the most for a lot of uh, companies uh, uh, viewing today um, in the alternative protein space, are nutrient content claims. And these are claims that suggest a particular level of a nutrient. So I talked about it a little before, um, high in, rich in, excellent source of. When you use those words that have been specifically defined, your 
suggesting a specific claim, which is that you have 20% or more of the reference nutrient. So if you say it's an excellent source of vitamin C, you're basically saying there's at least 20% of the daily value of vitamin C. The, the, the recommended daily intake for vitamin C happens to be uh, 90 milligrams. So when you say it's an excellent source of vitamin C, you're saying there's at least 18 milligrams of vitamin C per serving in here, um, it, in, in the product. And if it's not, then you're clearly in violation of the law and it's an easy class action lawsuit for a plaintiff lawyer. And there are a number of plaintiff lawyers who just go around and they look to see companies making these nutrient content claims and they check them with the nutrition facts panel to compare and confirm whether they have the requisite level to make that claim. Similar with contains or good source of, that means 10 to 19% of the daily value. So a little bit lower standard, but still defined. Um, if it's not specifically defined, it's going to likely be viewed as synonymous with the high standard of 20% um, or more. So I have clients all the time who wanna be a little bit more creative um, say things like, you know, overflowing with protein or um, protein packed, um, you know, any of those types of statements are going to basically be viewed as synonymous with 20% or more of the daily value. Um, there's also regulations um, addressing uh, calories. Uh, low calorie is 40 calories or less. If you have more than 40 calories, you can't say low calorie. Um, Sugar, there's actually no standard of low sugar. So you're not allowed to make a low sugar claim because there's no standard as to what constitutes low sugar. It's the same with carbohydrates. We see a lot of low carb claims. Technically, that's not a permissible claim because there's no threshold or standard as to what constitutes low carb. So one person's low carb might be three grams. Another person's low carb threshold might be 20 grams, especially if you're comparing it to something else. And so since there is no standard, you're not allowed to make low claims unless they're specifically defined like low calorie, low fat. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into all of these. I, I think the main point to make is a lot of these claims are very specifically regulated by set parameters. And it's really important that you either know or work with someone who knows those parameters to ensure that you're making appropriate claims. Because otherwise, you're just hanging yourself out there for actions from class action attorneys looking to you know, make some money and, um, and develop uh, a, class a, uh, a class action lawsuit. Um, organic is another claim. Um, that was what, that's one of the few claims that's regulated by the USDA. Um, we actually don't see a lot of litigation over organic claims. And the main reason for that is because it's very specifically defined. There's really four tiers of organic um, in order to say 100% organic. And it means what you think it would. All of the ingredients have to be organic, 100%. Um, to use just the regular word organic, 95 to 99% of the ingredients uh, must be organic. If you have between 70 and 94% organic ingredients, then you can make a made with organic blank claim. And you have to identify at least one and up to three organic ingredients. You're not allowed to just say made with organic ingredients because it's unclear then which ingredients are. So you're allowed to identify um, at least one and up to three. And then the fourth standard is if it's less than 70% organic, you cannot use the word organic anywhere on the labeling other than the ingredients list. You can identify certified organic ingredients in the ingredients list, but otherwise you're not allowed to use the word organic. Important to note here is that you can only use those terms 100% organic, organic or made with organic, let's say beets, if the product has been certified organic. So even if the the product has 100% organic ingredients, it still has to go through the organic certification process in order to use the word organic um, in your packaging or labeling. Um, 
probably the number one question I get, um, uh, there's two, uh, and I'll talk about both of them, is can I copy someone else's label? <laughs> and for those of you who've heard me speaking before, my, my general statement is sure, as long as you're copying the A plus student, because otherwise you're just copying the wrong answers. And it, it's all, not always clear whether A, whether you're copying the A student, or you can even be copying the A student, but your circumstances might change it. So brief example, let's say you're copying someone else's label who has a similar product to you and they make a low calorie claim um, and their product happens to be 35 calories, okay? Um, you have a similar product, it happens to only be 10 calories more, but your product is 45 calories. They might be doing everything else right, but you can't say low calorie because you don't meet that threshold of low calories. So they might be the A plus student, but their circumstances are different than yours. So it's a, a dangerous proposition to just copy companies. And I get, you know, especially copying, most people think, well, they're a large company, you know, so they gotta be doing it right. Large companies get warning letters all the time because things slip through the cracks. Um, so again, sure you can do it, but you're taking a little bit of a risk if you don't have someone who really knows what they're doing, you know, take a look at it, whether it's internally or externally and make sure it's compliant. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, just advertising from an FTC perspective. Again, I wanna make sure we, we leave some time left. So I'll try to run through this in maybe our last 10 minutes and then we'll get to uh, some Q and A because I see we've got a good, probably 20 uh, Q and A questions uh, lined up. Um, so we talked about the USDA and the FDA. The FTC is the primary federal agency that monitors advertising. Um, they're charged with enforcing section five of the FTC Act, which prohibits uh, deceptive and unfair uh, acts and practices. Um, and really it comes down to three different truth and advertising principles. All advertising must be truthful and not misleading. It must be fair, and you must have adequate substantiation for any claim. So again, truthful. Um, I like sometimes to go back to some of the old uh, advertising where you didn't really have to uh, meet some of the same standards uh, that we do now. We'll, we'll see some of those at the end. This is one of my favorites. I teach a high school class on marketing and advertising. Um, Look at these boxes, and this is a good example of, uh, you know, what is potentially misleading advertising, uh, not even potentially, uh, it clearly is. You look at this picture on the left, and it looks like a fairly big pool for your backyard, four kids playing in it pretty easily, and now you see the pool blown up and the girls standing next to it, and you wonder where well, did they go to the island of Lilliputia from Gulliver's Travels for, for these kids? Because there's no way four kids are playing in this pool in the same way. You also see the one above here. You got six kids playing basketball, doing whatever with, in this pool. And then you see it here next to the, re, the reality of how big it really is. Clearly, a lot of, you know, most people would look at this and say, you know, that is misleading advertising to have that picture on the front when it is nowhere close to reality. Um, a lot of times it's the way words are used. The words itself, you know, that might be a truthful statement, but again, it has to also be not misleading. So the guy walking along, all cars reduced, and then you look, it's a truthful statement probably compared to the usual uh, cars that are there. But that's not the meaning most people would attribute to all cars reduced, you would think would mean the price and not the actual size of the cars. Um, again, <laughs> boneless chicken, technically true, not again, probably what you're typically thinking of when you're thinking of boneless chicken. <laughs> Substantiation has become a big issue for companies here. Um, all health claims must be substantiated with competent and reliable scientific evidence. For years, the FTC definition of this was test analyses, research studies, or other evidence that have been conducted and evaluated in an objective manner by qualified persons that are generally accepted in the profession to yield accurate and reliable results. 
when I'm giving uh, presentations on location at, at various trade shows, I usually ask for a raise of hands afterwards about how many people actually have a good understanding now of what that definition is. And there are very few hands get raised. It's a terrible definition. Um, essentially, the gold standard for substantiation is a double-blinded placebo-controlled clinical trial uh, on the product. If you don't have that, then next best is on one or more of the ingredients in your product at the amounts in your product. This is really important. I get people all the time who want to talk about a study on, let's say, vitamin D or, you know, these days in immunity or zinc. And they, you know, say, well, I, you know, everyone knows that vitamin C is good for the immune system. You have to have a study that shows that the 100 milligrams of vitamin C in your product has been designed to do this. And it's really to prevent what the FTC sometimes refers to as the fairy dust principle. They don't want people putting, companies putting, you know, trace amounts of an ingredient in the product so they can call it out and tout all the benefits of that ingredient when they know that they don't have enough of that ingredient to actually provide any benefits. So the FTC recently updated their guidance in December 2023, the Health Products Compliance Guidance, um, and uh, and basically doubled down on the fact that they really believe that a human-controlled trial um, is really the only proper substantiation to have for claims. So really important for you to have substantiation once you start making any sort of health claim for a product. Um, I'm not going to go too much into endorsements and testimonials um, today, other than, you know, this is an area of increased focus from both the FTC and the FDA for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, the FDA and the FTC both view endorsements as very influential uh, types of advertising. And so it's really important to make sure that they're accurate. I think probably one of the most important things for companies to keep in mind is that once you use a testimonial in your advertising, it becomes an adopted statement of the company. So you can't get around it by saying, well, this isn't what we're saying. This is just what, you know, uh, customers of us are saying about our product. Once you use that in your marketing or advertising, it now becomes a statement of the company. So a company cannot use a testimonial that makes claims that the company could not make itself. So Let's say I'm making a, a dietary supplement product, Justin Procknow's immune support. And, you know, I get all these great testimonials from people saying, man, I use Justin's immune support. I never get colds and flu anymore. I cannot use that testimonial in my advertising, which includes it as a customer review on your own website. If it's a customer review on Amazon, not a lot you can do about it. But if it's a customer review on your website, where you have control over the content, you cannot use reviews that make claims that you're not allowed to make. I can't say that my immune support product treats colds and flu because the FDA views colds and flu as disease claims. And so I can't say that. I can't use a testimonial that says that as well. Um, Testimonials touting personal experiences, again, are likely to be representative. This is really more for weight loss. Um, ads, uh, you know, again, you can't use a testimonial that um, says I lost 80 pounds from using this product if that's not what a typical person can expect from the product. And if it's not what a typical person can expect, then I either have to identify what a typical person can expect um, if I've done a clinical study, or I need to be very specific about this person lost this weight by doing this. They ran, you know, uh, they walked for 90 minutes a day. They were on a 1500 calorie diet and they drank two of our, you know, weight away protein shakes. Uh, very specific if you don't have the evidence of what it is. Um, FDA in particular, but FTC as well, really um, closely scrutinizes before and after pictures important to understand that even if you don't say anything, a before and after picture can still be a, um, a claim. Um, and if you look at here, clearly there's a claim being made that you might look like Shrek, but take our 
uh, bodybuilding product, you'll look like Hulk afterwards. Um, you know, those are claims uh, that are going to need to be substantiated. Last thing I'll talk about with respect to advertising is material connections. This has been a big increase in focus by the FTC lately. If you're using endorsements or testimonials and there's some material connection between the person giving the testimonial and the company, that needs to be disclosed. So here we have an ad of, of a man touting the large weight loss he achieved with a product. Let's say he's actually part owner of the company. He needs to disclose that. It doesn't mean that what he's saying isn't true, but the FTC um, and the FDA say that's information that someone should at least um, have when they're deciding how much weight or credibility to give to a particular testimonial. Um, this is the same for celebrity endorsers. Used to be pretty obvious when a celebrity was endorsing a product. You take a commercial on TV, you know, Michael Jordan doing Gatorade or, or whoever, you know, celebrity doing an ad on TV, pretty clear that that's an endorse, you know, that they're advertising the product. Less clear these days when you have celebrities on talk shows, celebrities on Twitter or Facebook, if they're getting paid for the product, they need to disclose that. You know, if you have someone that goes on a talk show and is talking up, you know, this great clothing line that they're wearing um, and they're the owner of the clothing line, they need to disclose that. Um, uh, again, um, you know, if someone's posting things on Twitter and they're a paid spokesperson, there needs to be a disclosure that it's a paid uh, advertisement. Um, and you can do it organically just in a blog. And like here, this person says, um, uh, you know, I ended up paint, using Paint World's amazing just one coat paint in Canary Sunrise. Paint World sent me two gallons to try out and this paint is amazing. So in there, she's disclosing that she was given product. Um, you know, this this is a, a famous uh, tweet from Selena Gomez saying something like, you know, uh, Coca-Cola, not, you know, um, uh, love it, but even more amazing when your lyrics are on the bottom. Okay, she's also a paid spokesperson for Coca-Cola. So important that she discloses that when she's making claims about a particular product. Um, FTC has uh, issued some guidance on this. Um, just again, important to make sure that disclosures are made. Uh, uh, like that slide didn't quite get um, properly formatted. Um, but again, you know, for those of you who use influencers um, um, in your advertising, most important thing is making sure that that's disclosed, that it's a paid ad and not just someone's off the cuff uh, reaction to something. Finally, uh, from a litigation standpoint, um, the, we talked about a little before the top 10 kind of claims that get hit. All natural is probably number one. I would never recommend saying all natural uh, unless you plucked it off a tree or pulled it out of the ground and just stuck it in a box or a can. And even if you do that, you might get sued and I'll probably win it, um, but it'll cost you a couple hundred thousand bucks. So really just not worth it. I would try to focus more specifically on saying something like made with all naturally derived ingredients or naturally sourced ingredients. Um, talked about unsubstantiated claims, made in the USA claims. It's important. Um, the FTC just issued some new guidance on this. I said, you're not required to say made in the USA, but if you do it, you need to be very clear. Um, made in the USA means that not only was the product manufactured or assembled in the USA, but all or virtually all of the ingredients are from the USA. And if that's not the case, then you need to make a qualified claim like, made in the USA with, uh, you know, with foreign, with, uh, you know, globally sourced ingredients, something like that to make it clear it's, um, you know, some of the parts or components. And in the case of the food, the ingredients are also not from the USA. Weight loss claims get hit a lot. Um, we talked about nutrient content and healthy and nutritious <laughs> standard of identity. We've certainly talked about, these are all, types of claims that get hit from class action plaintiff lawyers, again, kind of emphasizing the need that you really want to have someone internally or externally 
take a good look at your labels because this is, you know, how you differentiate yourself from other companies, but also what puts you on the radar of class action lawyers. Um, I have to make sure some of this formatting gets cleared up before everyone gets a copy of this. Um, food manufacturing, you know, when you're manufacturing food, it has to be compliant with the good manufacturing practices found at 21 CFR Part 117. You know, you're required to have standard operating procedures for things like product complaints, product returns, uh, recalls. Even if you're having someone else doing your manufacturing, you as the brand owner are required to have SOPs for certain things to, to show that you are um, dealing with issues as they come up. The Food Safety Modernization Act was implemented with a goal for ensuring food safety. Um, some of the things that the Food Safety Modernization Act have addressed, preventative control for foods, stronger uh, hazard management and allergen um, uh, controls, um, same with for animal food. Um, vetting foreign suppliers of ingredients, um, produce standards, all of these with a design to help um, ensure uh, safe food. I, I'm gonna end with this. I like to end with this just, it, it gives you a good idea of how advertising has morphed over the years and uh, truthfully find it hard to believe some of these things actually happen. We had vitamin donuts. Uh, don't think that would probably pass muster from uh, either the FDA or certainly class action lawyers, you're going to get a letter from a class action lawyer uh, for touting your vitamin donuts. Um, Velve Velveeta is full of health. Um, pretty much guessing that Velveeta doesn't meet the standards of healthy um, as set out in the regulations. Uh, we had cocaine tooth drops, toothache drops, um, you know, I guess this was 1885, so I'm not going to hold them uh, to, uh, looks like a little Lincoln log uh, uh, thing down below here. Um, really a lot of, it's amazing how much, how, how much kids were used in advertising. Um, again, not sure Hires Root Beer, well, I'm, I'm almost positive Hires Root Beer doesn't uh, meet the uh, criteria for uh, using the word health or healthy in advertising. Uh, here we have a young man you might recognize as uh, Ronald Reagan uh, touting uh, cigarettes here. Um, again, the the use of kids and babies, perhaps my favorite one is this one about for a better start in life, start cola early. How soon is too soon? Not soon enough. Laboratory tests over the last few years have proven that babies who start drinking soda during that early formative period have a much higher chance of gaining acceptance and fitting in during those awkward preteen and teen years. So do yourself a favor, do your child a favor, start them, I can't even read it without laughing, start them on a strict regimen of sodas and other sugary carbonated beverages right now. Uh, I'll let that sink in. Um, here's some babies touting <laughs> Marlboro cigarettes. Uh, this is perhaps my favorite. Um, the best things in life come in cellophane. There was actually a meeting where people sat around a table and decided, you know, it would really be great is if we wrap our baby in cellophane and use that in our advertising. Um, and then this one to promote ride sharing. When you drive a car, you drive with Hitler, ride your bicycle today. Uh, there you have it. Uh, that's the advertising we've seen over the years. Um, I will... Um, Here's some information um, if you uh, need additional follow-up. I think this PowerPoint is going to be available, and uh, I will turn it back over uh, to Audrey. Thank you so much, Justin. That was a fascinating presentation, and uh, I still can't get over some of those advertising. No. <laughs> it's, especially it's the Coca-Cola and, and babies. Uh, hopefully not too many people listen to that one. Yes. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone uh, we have for joining us. Um, we have about 20 minutes left for Q&A. Uh, so just a reminder, if you have questions, uh, please go ahead and submit those in the Q&A box. We'll just try to run through as, as many as we can, trying to take advantage of Justin's expertise today. Um, 
So Justin, our first question here, and I'm going to try to interpret these the, the best that I can. Um, they're, you know, asking if the term vegan milk is okay to use. Can you also use terms like vegan beef or vegan steak? Um, yeah. What are your thinking on those terms? So uh, I suppose the real question is depends on who you ask, whether they say that's okay or not. Um, I would say this, um, again, there's still no formal law or regulation that has approved these types of statements. So I would always say the more explanation or qualification, the better. Um, I, I think there's certainly an argument to be made that vegan would sufficiently um, do, but I would also say that there's probably a segment of the population who doesn't really know what vegan means. Um, so I would probably, you know, if it was a client of mine, I would recommend if you're going to say vegan meat or vegan steak or, or vegan milk, that you use that in combination with something else than also further. So if you're saying vegan milk, I would probably still also recommend saying dairy free or, uh, you know, plant based or something else in addition to that just to further clarify it. I would say, again, there's an argument, but it's not necessarily a slam dunk that you would win that argument in all cases. Thank you. And our next questions here are around uh, daily values. So the first one um, was actually about daily values and if they apply to things like oils or vegetable oils, do you need to have a daily value for that? No, so I mean it, it's only the things that are specifically in the nutrition facts panel. So again, it's uh, calories, total fat, saturated fat, trans fat. Um, no one has trans fat anymore, or at least they shouldn't. Um, cholesterol, sodium, uh, total carbohydrates, dietary fiber, total sugars, added sugars, protein, and then any vitamins or minerals in the product. Those are the nutrients we call the macronutrients but it's essentially anything in a nutrition facts panel is what you're required to declare the daily value percentage truthfully protein's the only one that's a optional uh declaration of the daily value percentage um not optional as we talked about if you make a claim about it but otherwise uh you, you figure those out and the what they call the either the DRV for the non vitamins and minerals, the daily recommended value, or the RDI, which is the recommended uh, dietary intake, they're all set out in um, in two separate tables in the regulation which addresses uh, nutrition facts panels. It's um, 21 CFR 101.9. And truthfully, if you just put that into to Google or whatever search browser. Um, that regulation will come up and then you can take a look at it. And that's um, that's usually the, the fastest way, but yeah, you just go through, find that value, divide it by the amount that you have and you get the daily value percentage. Great, thank you. And um, I guess building off that a bit, if you make a protein claim verbally, visually, or on social media, do you need to call out the daily value if you have a small label that does not necessarily yep. require a nutrition facts panel? Great, great question. There are some exemptions um, to the requirement to include a nutrition facts panel. You have to include one in some form if it's the total available labeling space is 12 square inches or more. So it's a really small amount that um, where you're exempt from the nutrition facts panel altogether. Or the other reason is if you have very small sales, if you're a very small company that has limited sales, you are allowed to omit the nutrition facts panel. However, the caveat to not including a nutrition facts panel is always that you, you not make any uh, nutrition claims or provide other nutrition information. So once you make a protein claim, you void yourself from being able to exclude the nutrition facts panel. So the answer is yes. If you make a protein claim, you are required to call out the daily value percentage because you're actually required to now include a full nutrition facts panel as soon as you provide any nutrition information. Got it. That is, that is good information to have there. 
And um, our next series of questions uh, are more around the fermentation category of all proteins. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one here is around um, if animal free is an appropriate qualifier. And we've been seeing uh, quite a few companies who are say making whey protein via precision fermentation, call it animal free whey protein. Um, what are your thoughts on using that qualifier? Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, it's certainly a potential option. I mean, there has, I'll, I'll be honest, there hasn't been, there's, there, there's not a lot of products out there. And so there hasn't just been the same level of um, history and, um, you know, not aware of much in the way of class actions on it. So I think it's an argument in the same way that you would say dairy free. Um, and again, I, I think part of it just comes down to as an overall view of the product, does the message get there that it's not, you know, that it's created by fermentation or bacteria or, or say, I see some of these other examples. It really just comes down to, does the packaging overall provide sufficient information for, for you to say that it's not misleading? Again, it's less likely to be an FDA issue. This is almost solely going to be a, a competitor from you know the meat industry or someone else saying that you are somehow being misleading. You know, when when we were going to do this presentation I mentioned a couple of years ago, one of the reasons we were doing it was because a variety of states started passing laws, as I'm sure you're aware of, um, on what can and can't be called meat or chicken or rice. You know, the state of Arkansas, I think, passed a law saying you can't call something rice if it's not from the grain. Um, and most of those state statutes have actually been put on hold pending First Amendment um, arguments. And um, one of the reasons we were going to have Jamie from Tofurky on there was because they were kind of leading the charge on on fighting a lot of those. And again, of, of course, all of those uh, state laws were being pushed by um, you know the various industries who, who were big industries in the state and saw these alternatives coming in and cutting into their share of the product. So. Um, you know, I would say to, to go back to that, I would say there's certainly an argument to be made. Um, I'm sure there's probably some plaintiff lawyers out there who, if you just said animal free without anything else, would say like, well, that that wasn't clear to me that it was saying. And so then it gets into an argument. So unfortunately, there's no, I see someone asking here, there's no approved statement of identity for you know, protein obtained by microbial fermentation. Again, I know GFI is, um, maybe you can talk to that a little bit, Audrey, or, or whoever else is on about what efforts you guys have been making on that. But we're still at the point where all of this is a little bit speculative. And again, it comes down to trying to make sure it's truthful and not misleading. And what's necessary for that, again, probably depends a little bit on who is who is answering that question. I would think that animal free was fairly clear, but I'm sure you could have some enterprising plaintiff lawyers who would somehow position that differently. That's good to know. And um, I will say from uh, my perspective, there seems to be a lot more um, consumer research that needs to be done in particular around some of these types of protein to really understand what, what is uh, clear um, and also what resonates with consumers um, around these products. So much of that research is underway and, and certainly much more needs to needs to be done before we have a complete understanding of that. I think um, that's right. I, I've, been, I've worked with several companies on some mushroom products and the myco protein. Uh, and I know at least one company, you know, got the trademark for that, um, but there's still, a, you know, does that make it clear what is meant by that? And I would say, you know, probably not in and of itself. And so again, the, um, there, as you said, there, there's still a lot of um, 
kind of um, field work that needs to be done and, and just general, um, you know, there's going to be some trial. Uh, so I, I would always default back to the more information you can provide or um, qualification of it, the, the less risk you're going to have that someone can challenge. Yeah, that's a, a great point. And uh, moving on a little bit from that topic, this next person is asking or saying, I've heard that for a claim to be substantiated, the underlying research needs to be conducted using accepted norms in the research field. How do you think this might apply to claims on quality of a product? For example, new, better taste, preferred over XYZ yeah. um, for consumer testing. Um, and what would you say is the litigation risk when you're comparing yourself to another company or to an animal-based product? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, there are different standards depending on the claim. If you're making a claim like, um, again, uh, protein has been shown to increase muscle mass and help um, with overall um, health. You know, that is a claim that is going to require, we talked about, you know, scientific substantiation in the form of one or more well-designed clinical trials, you know, on that ingredient or similar ingredients. When you get into some of the more of the consumer perception um, comments, things like new, uh, maybe uh, certainly when you get into some of the taste, better taste, um, there are some standards that are, um, you know, there are some general consumer perception standards in terms of, you know, number of people, um, range of people. So you don't just have all women or all, you know, men over the age of 70 or all, uh, you know, white, uh, people that you have a, a good mix if you're going to be making a claim for a wide variety of people. I would say when you're doing comparison claims, your risk is almost solely with um, your competitors. I mean, you know, the general, the, the FDA or the even the FTC, unless it's just an egregious one, the FTC doesn't really get involved in better than, you know, comparison claims. It's going to be the competitors that you are comparing yourself to. And, and again, if you're doing that and you're making a claim like better, I mean, taste is probably less of an issue, but if you're saying better for you, um, and where we're really seeing, where we have seen some action between, um, and, and to go back to the guidance that the FDA issued um, on, um, on naming and also voluntary nutritional statements, the FDA, it's good that they're revisiting it because truthfully, the FDA kind of did the the plant-based alternatives a little dirty um, in that guidance by by recommending statements about uh, nutritional equivalence. Because once they put that in the guidance, then plaintiff lawyers are going to look at that and say, well, the FDA is recommending it. I mean, it, it really, it's misleading if you don't do it. And so um, we'll, we'll see whether the, the revised guidance really still includes that. But, you know, when we have seen some suggestions, it's because um, the, let's say, the the stand, the companies doing the standard ingredient, not the plant-based alternative, argue that the nutritionals are not the same. That, okay, yes, maybe, you know, the, the protein is the same, but a lot of the other nutrients that you know, are typically in that meat or other product, whether it's true or not, I'm not going to get into, you know, what those nutritional differences are, but that is typically where we see a lot of the action is the comparison of the nutrients and the claim that they're making the claim that it's the same, just plant-based, but it, in fact, it's not the same because of all of these differences in, in nutrition equivalency. Absolutely. Um... And then I guess kind of on that that health topic, uh, if someone were to talk about the general health benefits of plant-based meat consumption on their product's website, would that be considered a health claim for their product? Um, would you suggest that they don't do that or is that fine and safe to do? I'm sorry, can you say that again? It froze a little for me. 
Yeah, if uh, if a company were to talk about the general health benefits of plant-based meat um, and plant-based meat consumption on their products website, mm -hmm. would that be considered a health claim? Um, is that okay to do? Or would you suggest that maybe it's a bit dangerous for them? To yeah, so going back to what I said before, yeah, anything on the website is viewed the same as on the label. So it would be considered a claim that you must have substantiation for it. So you can't just kind of pull it out of nowhere. If you're going to be making claims about the health benefits, you have to have some sort of documentation to point to or to, to back up those claims if, if you're going to be talking about it. And websites definitely get looked at a lot, uh, uh, you know, by regulators in terms of whether those claims are correct or not. And so if you had a, say, a scientific study that you were referencing, would that be uh, significant enough documentation or verification of that? If, if it's what? If you had um, like some kind of uh, scientific study that you were referencing. Yeah, I mean. Be sufficient. And, and obviously it helps a little bit more in the context of like a website because you can go into a little bit more detail. Whereas, you know, if you say, hey, um, you know, you make a claim on the label, like protein helps, you know, um, again, um, build muscle mass, um, then, you know, you better have a, a really strong study. If you're talking about on the website, you can go into a little more detail and say, you know, a recent 2019 study, you know, talked about how protein build muscle and you and you can give a little bit more explanation. So I would say you have a little bit more leeway because otherwise typically I, you know, the answer to that would be it depends on how good the study was, uh, you know, and then, you, you know, not everyone can review a study and immediately determine on whether that's a credible study or not. So it, it does make it difficult. So again, if you're talking about it on the website, you have a little bit more leeway to go into more detail, maybe explain, okay, this was a study done on, you know, 20 people. Um, and, and so there's maybe not as much of the inferences being drawn as when you're, you know, being specific about it. Great. And we, it looks like we have time maybe for one more question. Um, and again, this is along the, the health side of things. If you have substantiated disease fighting claims for your food product or supplement, can you go through the FDA to allow that claim? And they're pointing out that Cheerios, uh, for example, claims that it lowers cholesterol. Yeah. Is the FDA the one who allowed them to say that? So it's a good point. We didn't really go into detail. And I, I did bring up the general mantra that you can't sell a non-drug product to diagnose, treat, cure, prevent a disease. When we talked about the types of categories of claims, I mentioned three, structure function claims, nutrient content claims, and health claims. There are a select number of authorized health claims that have been pre-approved by the FDA and are basically exceptions to that general rule that you cannot sell non-drug products to diagnose, treat, cure, prevent a disease. One of those is a claim that essentially says diets like high, you know, uh, low and saturated fat may reduce the risk of heart disease or something along those lines. So th there's about 12 to 15 health claims that have been specifically authorized if you meet certain levels of nutrients that you can make those claims. You can, you can also petition the FDA to make what are called qualified health claims. So if you have a specific ingredient that you believe there's evidence that it will do something, you can petition the FDA. It's not always as great as it sounds, because typically the FDA really waters down the claim and you've got to say something like some research, although not conclusive, has suggested that, let's say, you know, plant based meat may reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. However, more research is needed in order to really bear and, and the claim gets down so much. They're like, well, that doesn't really sound all that great. So. There is a process for doing it. I would say it doesn't happen very often. Again, there's only been 15 that have been expressly approved in a regulation. The others are qualified claims that um, end up watered down, but that would be the one way in which you can do it outside of that general mantra that you can't sell non-drug products to diagnose, treat, cure, prevent a disease. 
Great. Well, uh, that's about all we have time for today. Justin, thank you so much for the amazing presentation, answering all of these questions. We truly appreciate it. And everyone, just as a reminder, we'll be sending out a recording of this presentation, a copy of the slide deck, so you can revisit all of this great info. Uh, next month in August, we will be holding our seminar on life cycle assessments and how to conduct an LCA for your company. So we hope you tune into that. And um, thank you so much, Justin, for joining us today. Yeah, you bet. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, happy to uh, help out and, you know, continues to be one of the more interesting areas uh, for sure um, in the, um, you know, this whole area of, of plant-based uh, alternatives, the cultivated meat, the fermented meat, uh, you know, it's, it's, only continues to increase. And again, as evidenced by, I mean, people from Israel and Korea and Canada and France, uh, I know in particular, Israel has been a hotbed for um, that type of uh, innovation and uh, we don't see it dying down anytime soon. So it's great to see. Industry that's moving quickly. Yes, um, for sure. All right, everyone. We'll see you next month. Bye. All right. Thank you.